Hallelujah. I want to remind you, if you got your Bible, turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. As you're turning there, I want to remind you of our Connect Lunch. Immediately after the service, just out those doors and to the left, there'll be greeters and ushers who will help you. If you want to get connected with our church, learn more about it. As we said before, it's not a commitment. It's just an opportunity to find out who we are and how you may fit in to the plan of God here at Northgate. Also, it's great privilege and honor today to announce Chris and Shalane Law as our new Connect Directors. We're so glad to have them as our Connect Directors. You'll be hearing from them very soon. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 8, Hebrews 11 and 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And when he had went out, not knowing where he was going, by faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. I'm going to preach to you today from this subject, called into the unknown. Said that he heard the voice of God and he went, not knowing where he was going. How many understand that's what we've been called to? You got to either trust the voice of God or you have to evaluate with your eyes. You can't do both. You can't lean to your own understanding when the voice of God calls us into a place we've never been before. You can't evaluate God's words with your eyes and with your reason and your intellect. There are many things that God says in the word of God that to today's culture look strange. It doesn't make sense to them. It looks unknown. It looks like it doesn't fit into our culture. And I've told people for years, our problem, the culture's problem is that their main lens is the culture. And they look at the Bible through the lens of culture. When you do that, the Bible looks strange. But as a believer, we change that around and make the Bible our primary filter. And we look at the culture through the Word of God, and then we see things rightly. God's not going to come down and explain himself every time he speaks. Oh, I I will. I will. You better believe that because I know this. He's not going to come down and give you a road map in advance of where you're going. See, it doesn't take faith to do that. If I can evaluate the decision by myself, I don't need God and I don't need faith. If I can look out and weigh the pros and the cons, I don't need the voice of God and I don't need faith. But God has called his people in this hour into a place they have not been before, into a realm and a dimension that they have not known. And if we fall in love with the past, we will miss where God is taking us. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. That you would do a mighty work in this place today, God. Prepare us to hear your voice and to ready ourselves to move as you speak, Lord. It may not make sense. It may be taking us from the familiar, God, to the foreign, Lord. It may be taking us beyond where we've ever been before. We, We have no experience, Lord. But the question is, are we going to evaluate your word by what we see or by what we know about you? You are faithful, Lord. And I pray that we hear your clarion call today to step out into the unknown. That's where the supernatural begins. That's where provision happens. That's where healing happens. God, if we stay where we are comfortable and in control, we will never see the supernatural that you want and the revival that you want us to have. I pray today for a blessing on the saints of God and open ears to hear and a willingness to move. In Jesus' name, 
Clap your hands to the Lord. Give him praise. Give somebody a high five and say, I'm going to preach with him. All right, you promised. You promised. So if they get quiet, just look over and say, you said you were going to help him. I heard you. You know, when we read this, it probably doesn't strike us of how difficult this decision was for Abraham. It may not strike us as a remarkable act of faith, but it simply proves how unfamiliar we are with the culture of the ancient Near East. It's a tribal culture. It's a family culture. And there are reasons for that. Number one, the bigger family you had, the bigger army you had. The better you could protect yourself from marauders. And the bigger family you had, the more that could go out and hunt and gather and the more provision you had. People who didn't have families who were disconnected made themselves uh, uh, available to marauders and robbers and other things. The Mesopotamian world could be quite dangerous. Physical protection was often the result of being closely knit to one's kin and community. The more, the bigger your family was, the bigger army and the more protection. Travel in this time was particularly hazardous since it separated a person from his place of protection and exposed him to thieves and people with ill intent. And in light of the fact that Abraham left Haran and traveled to a land that he did not know, it is indeed a remarkable act of trust. And here's what I want you to understand. You've got to decide, do I trust my eyes or my intellect or do I trust my God? You can't do both. You're going to have to decide in this season of stepping into the miraculous. I trust the voice of God. I trust the God who saved me. And if he's taken me somewhere, he has something better for me than where I am. I know, I know, I know this makes us uncomfortable. We hate change. We hate transition. It takes us out of our comfort zone. It takes us from the familiar to the unknown. We fear what we can't control. Oh, y'all don't want me to stop and preach there. You don't want me to stop and preach there. We like control, right? We like to control it. But as long as you're in control, God is not. You can grasp over control. You can try to know your environment. You can try to limit the risk. But ultimately, that is not a life of faith. The life of faith is risk. It is going into the unknown. It is leaving what we've known before and moving into a place we've never seen. Transition moves us from control to trust. We can't learn that God is trustworthy if we're unwilling to follow him into uncharted territory. Amen? You will never learn that here where you've already been and what you've already experienced. We must leave behind what is familiar. We must turn toward what is strange. We must leave behind is the known, the tried, and the true, and the safe. What we must encounter is potentially hazardous. Amen. But here's what I know about God. God never asks us to leave something where he doesn't promise us something better. He never asks us to step out of something and a place of blessing that he doesn't promise us something better. And you know what I found? It's hard to leave success. Man, they had revival in Jerusalem. All through, up through chapter 7. They have revival in Jerusalem. The church is probably four or 5,000 people. They're, people are being added to the church daily, such as should be saved. They don't even have a, me, a, a meeting place that will house them all. But guess what? They got so enamored with success and revival in Jerusalem that they forgot about Judea and Samaria and the remotest part of the earth where they were called to. And you know what it took to get them out? Persecution. God had to come along and give them a push and said, I'm glad for what's going on in Jerusalem. I'm glad for the revival, but I've called you far beyond here. Don't forget about the people who've yet to hear and the people who don't know about Jesus. You've got a message and a witness, and I wanted to get out of here. And in order to scatter them, he had to send 
persecution on the church. Remember that when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, Jesus offered him something better than he had. Remember, he said, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. The problem is, we don't value unknown treasure. We don't value unseen treasure. We value what we can put our hands on. And if you're going to have eternal things, you're going to have to let go of some things in the natural. If you're going to have a revival and a shaking move of God, you're going to have to let go of normal services where you feel comfortable. I'm so tired of normal services. I don't know about you, but I, I, I want God to come in and shake this place. That from the back to the front, nobody can sit still. If there's someone here or far off from God, that they're sitting there holding on to the back of the pew going, let me get in the altar. Will you be quiet so I can come and get a relationship with Jesus? That's what I want to see. When they saw the disciples cleaning their nets, what did he say? He didn't say, just leave your father. He said, hey, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He offered them something better. Understand, if you don't leave your nets, you can never see what they saw. Imagine if they had said, hey, I know about fishing, and I know what my family's done, and I know how to make a living. Remember, they didn't even go back. The Bible says immediately they left their nets. They didn't call, Mama, is this going to be okay with you? You all right? I don't know how you're going to make it, but I hear the voice of God. I don't know if you could do that today in today's culture. Oh, y'all got quiet on me, didn't you? Now, I know what I'm talking about on this deal right here. Okay? I have a wonderful, supportive wife. Right? But when I start walking by faith, it makes her uncomfortable. Do you know women have a separate organ? It's somewhere in here. It says security. <laughs> and when you start moving into the unknown, and you start talking about starting another church and sending 50 people away, guess what? Alarm bells go off in here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And sure, I'm sure I could have talked about it more. I'm sure I could have done things better. But when God tells you to do something... I'm going to have to ultimately do it whether you feel comfortable with it or not, right? And I remember within the first couple of years of starting that church, we thought it was going to be 45 or 50, but convenience is king, and it was over 70 in the first year, right? It was over 70, but God spoke it. Hey, man, I remember within the first couple of years, I had elders and people came to me and said, I'm going to just tell you, I didn't think it was going to work at all. I thought you lost your mind. I, 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 I just didn't see how that was going to work. But we've already recovered back from that. And we didn't have a down year in giving. Amen. Because I'm here to tell you, when God tells you to move, you got to move. Between our two churches, there'll be over 500 people in service today. We could have never fit them in this building, even in two services. But, you, but God knew what he was doing. Did it make us uncomfortable? Did it make us worry? Yes. We're human. But God knows what he's doing. And I want you to understand something. When God told him to leave, he said, I'm going to to a place that I'll show you. It was no attractive description of Canaan which induced him to forsake his home. He didn't tell him it was a land flowing with milk and honey then. No, that's later. He didn't say, look, it's going to be awesome. You're going to like this much better than this pagan place. It, nor was it an ordinary immigrant's motive of a better economy that motivated him. He didn't know anything about it. He couldn't evaluate it. He only had to evaluate the God who spoke to him. Oh, I'm going to get preaching here in a minute. See, the life of faith must be entered at ignorance. Yes. If you know, it doesn't require faith. If you understand, it doesn't require faith, right? If you understood why every trial came into your life, you wouldn't need faith. But understand this, too. If God explains to you why you're having the trial, guess what that does? 
You have to find his explanation reasonable. Oh, yeah. See, it's an attempt for control. It's like, God, if you just explained it to me and I understood it, then I'd be okay with it. It wouldn't make it any less painful. It wouldn't make the grief of losing someone close to you any less painful. But then you, you could say, just like Job, remember Job, he could have explained it to Job and said, look, this is what was going on. Me and Satan were having this argument about you. I believed in you. He didn't. You're going to grain character out of this. You're going to have more than you had before. And then he could say, yeah, that, that's a good deal. But what if he said this is just about character? Job could say, hey, my, my kids' life weren't worth character. You think you want an explanation, but an explanation doesn't require trust. See, faith was for Abraham his authority for his starting, his journey. An authority that enabled him to defy the worldly wisdom, right? Imagine him going to Sarah. Hey, I heard a voice. We're leaving. I don't know about y'all, but I see some women's head cocked just like this. As soon as I said that. I love y'all. Y'all are awesome. Y'all are faithful women of God. But I understand when we come in there and say, hey, God spoke. You're like, you sure you didn't eat too much pizza? <laughs> you sure? You heard from God? Yes, I heard from God. We need to move right now. We need to get out of this. Imagine telling this family. They're like, you're crazy. I, I'm sure there were people who scoffed at him, much like the people who scoffed at Noah while he was building an ark for 120 years. They'd get in the boat. They were like, we've never seen rain. This doesn't make sense. But thanks be to God that he believed God in spite of the worldly wisdom and the scoffers. Or there wouldn't have been his family saved. Some people, you got to do the will of God. When nobody wants to do it. you got to go when nobody wants to go. you got to move when nobody feels like it's the right choice. Can you imagine what his family and friends said when a 75-year-old uproots his family on the word of God? Yeah. See, when God calls us to the adventure of faith, he does not furnish us a road map in advance. We have no idea that it'll be successful I remember when we had our first few meetings in my living room in Fort Worth do you realize that at that time 75% of new church plants fell within the fire first five years the statistics were against us we had 12 people to help us start yeah when we got when we got worship going we had a bass player we had a guitar player we had three singers i would come up and exhort do you realize there was about six here and six in the seats and let me tell you something i don't care how spiritual they are i don't care how demonstrative they are in a big church you sink it down to six and everybody gets quiet oh yeah you think it's great in here now because you can say amen and nobody hears you right but you say amen among six people and everybody's like that somebody new? There's no, there's no guarantee. Most of them fail, right? And there are many times where we wondered if we were going to get off the ground. But when God tells you to do something, you've got to move. Amen? Could I have done it better? Could I have thought about it? Could I have prayed and fasted more? Yes, but ultimately the word is still there. And I can't find out if God is going to keep his word if I won't start. We have this sinking feeling of having stepped out on nothing. But God always does wonderful things with nothing. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Job 26 and 7, he hangs the earth on nothing. Hallelujah. And he calls those things that are not as though they were, Romans 4, 17. Faith does not know why. If you read the book of Habakkuk, he just says, why, Lord? That's his whole refrain. Why, oh Lord, why, according to Habakkuk, one, two through three, right? Why? Why does this happen? Why is that happening? So did Job. Job wanted to know why. What's going on? God did not give them an explanation, but a revelation of himself. And the revelation of himself was enough. See, objections are answered by what? They are answered by who? Who am I following? Who called me out? Who saved me? Who changed me? Come in here, Lavelle, and help me for a minute. 
I trust Lavelle, okay? I'm going to close my eyes and you're going to lead me, okay? I don't know where I'm going, but I trust Lavelle. He could lead me. He could trip me. He could make fun of me. He may be making fun of me right now. I can't see, but I have to trust Lavelle, right? Well, think about this. I've only known Lavelle for about nine or ten months, right? How much more faith should I have in God who died for me and shed his blood for me and cleansed me? Gave himself for me. When he tells me to go, I need to go. I trust him even more than him. We need to have that kind of trust in our relationship with God. That, Lord, I may not understand it. Lord, it may not make sense, but I trust you. I know you're not going to lead me into trouble. I know you're going to help me. God did not give them an explanation but a revelation of himself. And then when they got the revelation, they said, he said, forgive me. I've spoken things that I don't understand. Right? See, when we see who, the why does not matter. See, one faith, one thing faith does know, I know in whom I have believed. I know who I believe. I know who my trust is in. I know who saved me. I know who washed me. And if he did all that for me, he's not going to lead me into anything that he can't provide for me in. I know I wish it was like in, in the wilderness. They had the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. When that thing started moving, they had to move. I wish we had that. I was like praying this week. I said, God, let a pillar of fire come down and start moving in a direction. So everybody that's following me, you go ahead and go, yeah, he's right. <laughs> he said, I know in whom I have believed. Right? Job says, when he has tried me, I know that I'll come out as pure gold. See, he knows the where's and the why's and the what's. He knows the way that I take, Job 23.10, right? Sight rests on something, somewhere. Faith rests on someone. We have got to decide that our someone is greater than our explanation of where. Amen. That our someone and what he's done for us in the past and proven to us is greater than the what's and the why's and the where's. That's what the world has. They want to make sure it's a sure thing. I know it's a sure thing based on who I'm following. Praise God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. If I follow him, grace and mercy is going to follow me all the days of my life. I know in whom I believe. Faith never knows where it's being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. It is a life of faith, not of intellect or reason, but a life of knowing who leads us. When he has, was called to go out, he went out. Whew. It is immediate. If you read the Hebrew text, he left. He packed his bags. There was no discussion. There was no thinking it over. He left. He, he had appeared to him in Ur, he had gone to Haran where his father died, and now he speaks to him there. He doesn't appear again in Haran. And he left. I said, would to God that such conduct were usual and universal with many. The call alone was enough to produce obedience. The call alone. And that's why the Bible says in Matthew twenty two four two, many are called, but few are chosen. The Lord's complaint in Proverbs 1, 24 is, I called out and you refused me. Worse still are the defiant generation like Zechariah who spoke and said in Zechariah 7, 11, they turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears from listening to me. Pray to God that when we hear the voice, we will move. Hallelujah. I believe that if he's moving us, what he's moving us to is greater than what we've experienced. It is greater than what we've experienced. There are only two ways to live. One way is the most common, by sight, to base everything on what we can see. This is the imperial way. This is the way the world lives, who has no hope beyond this life. That's how they live. When we start living like them, we've lost our faith. The other way is to live by faith, to base your life primarily and ultimately on what you cannot see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. I can't see it. But I know it's there. It's substance, right? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. I can't see it, but I trust who spoke it to me. Amen. I'm going to walk with him, and I'm going to trust him when I can't see it. What I love about Abraham was a great self-denier. 
He said, I got a good thing here. I'm 75 years old. I'm an old man. I got a big family. I got herds. And you're ready to uproot all this to somewhere I don't know? But isn't that what it says about discipleship? He that would come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He is the father of the faithful, the one we look to, the very first who stepped out. If we are going to walk in his footsteps, God has got to get us out of our comfort zone. Hallelujah. Out of the place that we're familiar with. He began his journey without any knowledge of the ultimate destination. He obeyed a noble impulse without knowing its consequences. He took one step and he did not ask where. And that is faith. To do God's will here and now. Quietly leaving the results to him. Faith is not concerned with the entire chain. It has devoted its attention to the first link. And the immediate link. How I many of you have made a decision for God and when you stepped out, you were uncertain. But as you kept walking and looking and you looked back, you were like, God, you knew what you were doing. You understood what I was going to go through. You are... Let me just say this. I could say this honestly as a church planner. If God showed me everything and the difficulty that it was going to take before I left for church planning, I wouldn't have done it. Neither would you. Mm-mm. Say, so here's what's going to happen. You're going you're to have trouble. You're going to have difficulty. You're going to have people leave over minor stuff. Huh? I would say, well, no, Lord, I want it to be just sunshine and roses. I want it to be every service somebody prays through. No. I, no, I had to trust him. See, faith is not knowledge of a moral process. It is fidelity in a moral act. Amen. Faith leaves something to the Lord. It obeys an immediate commandment and leaves him for the direction and the destiny. I know that he's going to lead me into something better. And when you have faith, you can have peace. Right? But if you don't have faith, you're like, I don't know. I, 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 I'm uncomfortable. We walk the floors. We chew our nails because you can't have peace if you don't have faith. Right? But if you have faith, it's like it's in your hands. You told me to leave. What you're going to do is in your hands. Lord, I trust you. I believe you. I know you're going to do something great. That's why the Bible says, he that believeth shall not make haste. Now, in other words, that, that word is translated in the Hebrew. He that believes will not panic or allow the unknown to overwhelm the faithfulness of God. Does what you see overwhelm what you know? See, if that's our case, we're in trouble. Concerning his yesterday's faith says, Thou hast beset me behind. Concerning my tomorrow's faith says, Thou hast beset me before. Right? Concerning my today, you have laid your hand on me. It's all covered as long as I walk with Jesus. My yesterday's, my tomorrow's, my today's are covered by walking with Jesus. Praise God. It's just enough. To feel the pressure of the guiding hand, Abraham was content and patient to lead a wandering and unsettled life of God. Do you realize he was promised the land, but he never settled in the land? Not in his lifetime, not in Isaac's lifetime, not in Jacob's lifetime. You know, the only thing he ever owned in Canaan was the cave of Machapella where he buried Sarah and he had to buy it. He's promised it by God. He walks through it. He sojourns in it. He's the owner of it in principle, but he never settles in it. He could say, God, you tricked me. But what it says is he looked for a city. He understood that Canaan was a type of the new Jerusalem. He had sights far beyond the natural. That's where people get upset because God says, I'm going to do this. And then when it doesn't come through, we didn't have our eyes high enough. He had his eyes on something that was eternal, who had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. Not just a temporary place to live, but an eternal dwelling place in the presence of God. Jesus said, if I go away, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. He had his eyes on something that was eternal, something beyond just the fulfillment of a temporary promise. you got to get your eyes beyond what 
what you want in this life, all this is going to perish. It's going to perish. It's going to melt with a fervent heat. If you set your heart on things that are just in this life, you'll always be disappointed. He accepted by faith and inheritance and trust without even knowing where it was. See, the faithless must know in advance what they are promised is far better than what they're giving up. They got to weigh the pros and the cons, right? But the faithful say, I trust you, Lord, that it's better. I trust you. I can't see it. I don't know where it is. I don't know how long it'll take me to get there, but I know who I'm following, and I know that you're faithful, and I know that you're, there's no variableness or shadow of turning in you. Faith is the foundation and the fountain of obedience. Obedience that God accepts never comes out of a heart that thinks God's a liar or is suspicious of his motives. Never does. You have to trust that God tells the truth. And if God is pointing in a direction and leading, we have to trust him. Even bad men will obey God when they see the reward. Right? Even faithless people, if they see the reward and they say, hey, somebody calls and says, hey, brother, we want to give you a bigger church with a bigger salary. You don't take no faith to do that. Right? But if they call and they say, hey, we want to give you a smaller church with a smaller salary. You can't evaluate that based with your eyes. Right? You can't evaluate that and just go, well, that's not a good, smart thing to do. What if God said go? What if God said leave? What if God said it's time for you to go down in life instead of up? But good men will obey even if the fulfillment of the promise does not happen in their lifetime. It is not ours to judge the Lord's command, but to follow it. That's what's happened in our culture today. Everybody's judging God and judging His Word. Well, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like it's, it, it's something we should do. It's not for us to judge His Word, but to follow it. Because you'll never experience the blessings until you learn to follow without understanding. <laughs> Hallelujah. Think about this. He's promised a land, but the only residence he ever had was a nomadic lifestyle. Promised a land, but Abraham never lived in or settled in the promise. What sustained him was a faith in an eager outlook for a city that was eternal, that was beyond the land. That's what sustained him. I don't know about you, but heaven sustains me. I know we don't preach about it much anymore, but heaven is what sustains me. If he never heals me in this life, he's ultimately going to heal me, praise God. If I'm never wealthy in this life, I'm going to walk on streets of gold. Gold is going to be so abundant, I'm going to walk on it. What sustains me is the city beyond this life, not the blessings of this life. If I never did build a church bigger than this one, that's all right. I'm going to have a mansion in heaven. See, our problem is we've got our eyes just like the culture on this place. And we evaluate God based on what he gives us now and not what he's promised later. We evaluate God on what he does now. we got that Janet Jackson faith. What have you done for me lately? Mm, Y'all don't want me to preach in here. Well, I prayed about this and I prayed about this and none of this happened. See... Our problem is we, we don't have big enough dreams. I got a dream for a place where there's no sickness. Where I'm going to see my Lord face to face, amen, in this body with these scars. I'm going to experience joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm going to watch the angels say, holy, holy, holy. I'm going to cast my crown at his feet. That's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me moving. I don't have my eye on what he's doing now. I got my eye on his promises. That'll be fulfilled. See, our problem is when we're frustrated and God hasn't done what we thought he should do. You know what has to die for us is the God of our plans. He's not your butler. He's not. The God of our plans has to die. Because he's made in our image and he does everything that we want him to do. But you know what Abraham did? He sojourned through that land. But every time he had an opportunity to get frustrated, he looked up and said, I'm looking for a city who has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Do you realize that not until Revelation 22 do we see the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven? 
Abraham saw it by faith. See, can see things that nobody else can see. Everybody else was like, hey, you left your family and your country and your kindred and you never settled in the land he said you could have. You never even became the father of many people. You only had a few sons in your lifetime. But he lifted his eyes beyond. That's what I do. When I'm having a struggle and I'm wondering why God doesn't come through, I lift my eyes and I turn to the back of the book and I read the description of the place that he's prepared for the saints of God. And I get joy. I get encouraged knowing that it might not happen now, but one day I'm going to be in a choir with 10,000 times 10,000 praising the name of Jesus. See, Abraham framed his entire existence in the anticipation of the fact that God would be faithful to his promises. In other words, I'm going to get happy today. Abraham was faithful in the present because of his confidence of what God would do in the future. I can't tell you that God is going to answer your prayers the way you think he will. But I can promise you that when you step through those pearly gates, it's going to be worth it all. Amen. I can promise you, you're going to forget about every answer and answer prayer here. And you're going to realize God was faithful and he had something better for me. You realize that? When you read in the book of Hebrews, get back there about verse 30, 32. And he talks about those who were sawn asunder and destitute, dwelt in caves. So they didn't even value their life seeking a better resurrection. They gave up their life. Why? Because they had their eyes on something that was eternal. See, if your life is important to you in this thing, then all the enemy has to do, if it's more important than eternal things, all God has to do, all the enemy has to do is threaten your life, and you'll shut down. But it says of them that they looked for a better resurrection. They had their eyes on something eternal by faith. He beheld something that was coming, but he never saw the fulfillment of the promise or those vast descendants living in the land. See, to dwell as a stranger in a land without rights of citizenship or possessionship, even in Genesis, the sojourning of Abraham and his sons in the promised land is designated as visitors, and they were considered aliens in the land of promise. That didn't bug them. They didn't think God had lied to them. They had their eyes on something eternal. Hallelujah. Faith always picks out the eternal. Think about that. The situation of the patriarchs or their wandering was an expectation for a city, an eternal city. Their sojourning was not restless or random, but rather a form of patience in view of a future realization. You see, the more and more I've seen it, do you realize how often in the New Testament that they encourage one another with the rapture and the coming of the Lord? Hey, that's what encouraged them. He said, I can't promise you he's going to get you out of this, this persecution that you're suffering. I can't promise you that he's going to ease the load here. But if you'll be faithful, there is something laid up for you, imperishable, incorruptible. God is going to pay you back. Amen. God is going to pay you back eternally what you suffered in a temporal situation. That's why he says, our light afflictions. Because he's comparing it to a far greater weight of glory that's eternal. That's why it's life. Because he's got his eyes on something that lasts forever. He calls them momentary and light. Why? Because he's comparing them to the eternal. All right, mamas, I'm going to need some help. I'm going to close this thing down. But I need some help from the mamas. I need your help because I don't have first hand experience of this. I've given you the theology. Now I'm going to give you the practical. All you mamas that had babies and grandmothers, I'm going to need some help from grandmothers too. When you get pregnant, you have life in the womb. When you find out you're pregnant, that is cause for celebration. But may I say that's not the finish line? That's a wonderful thing, something to be celebrated. We can have our gender reveals. I don't know, and some people, they may have to have like 40 colors now. (laughs) 
I said some people, I don't know. I know what pink is, I know what blue is. <laughs> People get uncomfortable. <laughs> That's how the world has, has, in other words, pressed us into their mold. Because they've made us sensitive about things that they think are more important than the Word of God. I'm just putting it in perspective. Can I put it in perspective for you? But anyone who's talked to mothers, I, I had a wife who was pregnant twice and would have been three times if it wasn't been for me. Sorry, honey. But if you've been pregnant, you understand fully aware of the weight gain. Can I get a witness? The discomfort of pregnancy. You know, when you get like nine months and that baby wants to turn over and that elbow comes out, looks like an alien. Yeah. And your feet are so big that you can't put any shoes on. Come on, help me, ladies. I mean, that's a real deal. That's a real experience that we have, right? Swelling feet, strange new cravings. I don't think Gina had any cravings, but there were things that she smelled that would upset her immediately. Bacon. She loves bacon. But when she was pregnant, she would smell bacon. She was like. <laughs> and here's what's the thing. I don't know what it is about pregnant women. When I think of nausea, I think of don't want to touch food. But here was the deal. We would be eating. She would smell something that would kind of set her off. She would go to the restroom, kind of take care of that, and come back and start eating. And I was just like. <laughs> because I'm thinking, if I'm nauseated, I don't want to look at food. But she felt better. It had passed. I'm hungry now. I'm like. So I don't know all of the strange situations you had, but, but I, under know, I know that it's difficult. And understand this, we're willing to undergo the negative of pregnancy for birth. And there are no promises, right? We don't know that it's going to turn out well. We believe that it will, but we don't know, right? Why? Why are we willing to go through all of that pain, all of that change, right? All that discomfort, being unable to sleep. I was talking to a mother who's near uh, her birth date soon, and uh, she said, right on, let's have this baby. Let's get this. She's done. She's like, I've carried it. I've nursed it. Let's get it out. Right? I was singing to her later, that little song. I think it's by Gloria Gaynor. I'm coming out. <laughs> I want the world to know. God, do let it show. Come in. <laughs> right? But why are we willing to go through all that? Because the joy of having a child will far outweigh all the pain and the discomfort and the money spent, right? We do this in life all the time, but all of a sudden we get to faith and we freak out and we're like, what's going on? What are we doing? Think about that. What's your mother going to say when you start labor and you chicken out? And you say, oh, mama, I don't know if I can do it, mama. I have a low tolerance for pain. Don't take me to the hospital, even though my water broke. What's mama going to say? You should have thought of that nine months ago, brother, sister. <laughs> this was a part of the deal. I told you. I prepared you, right? You should have thought about that earlier. But that's not what we do. We may be a little bit nervous when we pack our bag and we go because there is an unknown. I know my examples sound irrational and unlikely, but Grandma, you can help me. There are a few things sadder than to carry a baby for nine months, but never have the joy of holding that because we were afraid of birth. There are risks in pregnancy. Absolutely, there can be complication with the baby's development. There can be genital Defects. It can be all kinds of things. We're not promised a healthy baby. But very few people I see go into pregnancy going, oh, I hope it's healthy. I hope it's healthy. Right? We just, we just don't. That's our life. We learn to live by faith in other areas. But when God begins to call us and speak to us, all of a sudden we forget these common examples that we use all the time. 
Is there a risk to the mother's life? Yes. In rare occasions, but there are risks. And think about it. The husband could lose his wife and his child in the birth. I remember when Riley, she, Gina was in labor for a long time, and then her heart rate didn't bounce back up. And they said, we're afraid that the umbilical cord is around her neck. I said, let's take that baby right now. There were some frightening moments in that. But I want to know, all of that vanished. All of the danger, all the difficulty vanished when they put that baby in my arm. And I spoke her name and she looked at me in an instant. Everything. What I'm trying to tell you is that God has some babies that are going to be born in this church in the next nine weeks. Amen. And it's going to overcome all of our fears and our worries of what we're having to transition in. Think about it this. I know children aren't, I gotta finish with this. But I know children aren't this developed. But let's say that they had they had an adult mind in the womb. What if the baby had a choice whether they wanted to be born or not? What if they treated transition of birth the way we resist change? Right? And they're like, no, I know this place. There's this little tube that comes in and feeds me. I'm comfortable in here. It's warm in here. I don't have to do anything for myself. I don't want to go out there. I don't know what's out there. I like my little environment. Well, what are the dangers of staying in too long? All right? Their bowel starts to work. All right? It starts to work while they're still in utero. They could swallow myconium could have great effects on them right but you have to understand that baby understands you know what this was a great place but it's getting crowded in here this was awesome at first but now I can't move in here and I'm sure it's not a great experience for the child either right impressed and move but you know what thanks be to God that God takes over in those places and we trust him amen and we have to trust him in those instances God is moving in a mighty way. You know, someone asked Helen Keller, is there anything worse than being blind? She replied, yes, to have no vision. To have no vision. And the only way you can have vision in the spiritual is by faith. It's to look beyond where you are. Stephen Covey, the author of Seven Secrets of Highly Successful People, said the risk of riskless life is the greatest risk of all. He said, don't end your life wishing you'd stepped out and followed God. Go ahead and do it. You won't be rewarded in heaven for well said. You'll be rewarded for well done. Your dream will always be tested. The value of your dream is how much you're willing to pay for it. That's always the test of is the dream big enough. I want you to stand with me all over. How many of you, when you were single, you seen enough bad marriages, you were like, I don't know if I want to get married. I mean, it's okay. You're probably married now, but yeah, yeah, you were a little bit tentative, you know. You were like, I don't know, you know, my family's not great at it. I don't know if I want to chance it, you know, right? And you, you were gonna, you were gonna go and travel, and you're gonna do all these things first, right? You're gonna have your nest egg so you can buy your house first. Come on, help me. Don't act like it's only me. Right? We, we were going to get all this stuff right. We we're going to do it right. Then we were going to meet the person, right? We had all these plans and we had it figured out and we didn't like marriage and, and we were afraid of it. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't that you answered all those things. You met somebody who shrunk your objections. You met someone who shrunk your objections. You didn't work it all out, right? How many of you got married before you had all that stuff done? Yeah, because it was who that overwhelmed the what and the why. Right? It was somebody. For me, her name was Gina. And I'm going to tell you, this was not an easy courtship. Right? She gave me the friend zone quick. 
She said, I'm moving to Austin. You better not get stuck on me because I'm out here and I got career and I got life and, and I don't really want to be married to anybody who's a minister. Matter of fact, she told me the only thing worse than being married to a minister or preacher is being married to a bad preacher. <laughs> Never preached in front of her t- before that time. So the first time I preached, my ministry's on the line, my relationship's on the line. Yeah. Right? I remember I could tell that she was having second thoughts. And so we were someplace, and I said, hey. I said, look, if this ain't working out for you, if you, you know, this doesn't jive with you, just tell me. You know, just tell me. I'm, I'm a big boy. I'm not going to crawl up in a ball and die, I promise. I'm going to keep living for God. It's okay. It's okay. As soon as I took the pressure off, things got better. Right? We've been together 28 years now. 28 years. I would not, I would not change a thing, amen. Because God has taken on us a venture of ch- starting churches and planting other churches and sending ministry out beyond these walls and overseas. And it's been an adventure. But you can never have that unless you're willing to step out into a place you've never been before. So I'm praying today, if God is speaking to you, just step out from where you are. You've got the comfort of family and background and maybe history and tradition of the way your, church, the way your family was raised. But I just want you to step out beyond that and say, God, I hear your voice, and I'm going to trust that voice. I hear you drawing me to relationship, and I'm going to trust that. Hallelujah. If you need healing in this place, and, and you say, well, I've been to every doctor, and I've, I, I've gotten everything, and I've spent everything. I want you to just step out because I hear the voice of God say, today is the day of healing and miracles and signs and wonders. If you're a saint of God and God has something new for you in a new ministry, step out from where you are. Hallelujah. And believe God to do something mighty in this place. Hallelujah. 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 